I'm probably breaking the law by writing this down. And of course, a priest is not allowed to tell anyone what's this head inside of a confession. But I think this man's an exception. I, mean, I need to tell someone, anyone. I was a priest for quite a few years now. I've gotten used to the job. When a man comes into the church, went straight for the confession booth, I, I wasn't surprised at all. He didn't introduce himself, but it's not unusual either. Some people preferred total anonymity when they confessed their sins. I didn't get to see him properly. He wore a, a gray sweater. The hood was pulled up deep into his face, obscuring all his features. So I didn't think much about it. I just joined him in the booth like I was supposed to do. Greeted him with the same words I'd spoken countless times already. He stayed silent at first. He gave him a bit of time because I thought that he just didn't know how to begin. But after several minutes... I asked him what he wanted to confess. A few more seconds passed, and then he spoke. He told me that he'd gone into the woods. And he said that in a tone as if I should have known that already. That was all. He, he didn't elaborate any further. As if that would already count as a sin. I thought him to be a hunter then. Asking for forgiveness for the lives of the animals that he killed. Maybe it was his first time hunting, and... The weight of the innocent lives was heavy on him. I asked him to continue. He told me about a small clearing, where the grass is greener than the rest of the forest, about the small cabin that stood on said clearing. And then he fell silent again. I asked him why he considered this a sin, and that made him laugh for a second, and the sound made my skin crawl. It was... An ugly, manic laugh. He didn't explain his reasoning, just stood up and left. I was taken aback by all this, and sure, but I just assumed that it had been some weird joke. Either way, I was certain I'd never see the strange man again. I was wrong, of course. He came to the church the next day, and walked straight to the confession booth once again, expecting me to follow him. Of course I did, and that was my job, and also I hoped that he would clear a few things up. I thought a lot about his earlier confession. He only said that he barely slept lately. I answered that I, too, struggled with insomnia, and uh, I asked again why he considered this a sin. He laughed again. I had to tear my skin off. There was another person who visited the church frequently, outside of the services on Sunday. A young woman who always sat in one of the front rows and silently prayed for a while. We talked a bit sometimes. She was very polite. I liked her. When she came by the next time, she told me how she felt watched in her own home. And she didn't feel safe there anymore. She prayed for that terrible feeling to go away. And... Uh, and I took the time to pray for her safety. The strange man came by every single day, and he always spoke one or two sentences at most. None of them were a sin. After just three days, he started repeating himself, talking about the woods and about his insomnia again. Always the same things, like a broken record. Even the wording was the same. The first change came the day after my conversation with the young woman, as he stayed silent at first. I asked him if he knew her, just because I had a bad feeling about him. He laughed. I bit down on my lip until it bled. He didn't say a word that day. The man was bad news, I knew it. His visits were going on for over a week at this point, and I had I'd yet to see his face. He always wore that hood, and he went straight to the booth each time. Sometimes I only saw him in the corner of my eye. There was no pattern to his arrival. I tried... I tried coming in sooner or later, but it made no difference. He came by a few minutes after I got there. He seemed to know when he had to arrive to meet me. After a strange reaction to my question, I was even more worried about the young woman. Knowing that a freak like him was out there made my insomnia even worse. I lay awake in my bed thinking about her. When I couldn't take it anymore, I drove over to her house because I felt like the least I could do was bless her apartment. I hoped it would make her feel better. She was reluctant to let me in at first, poor thing. 
completely paranoid about something she didn't know was even real. She had never seen anyone, she had told me earlier. But there had been the most intense feeling of being watched. I explained my intentions, and then she finally stepped aside and led me into the flat. She appreciated what I was going to do, she told me. She would indeed feel safer if someone blessed the house. Then at least she could be sure God watched over her. I intended to begin where the feeling was worst, her bedroom. I had a single window that faced towards the backyard, and as I stood alone in that room and looked outside, I saw him standing there. He faced me, though his face was hidden under the hood of his gray sweater, and he stood perfectly still. We stayed like that for several seconds. He began to laugh. The window was closed, but the sound was so loud as, as if he stood right beside me. He scratched my skin violently. The young woman burst into the room and yelled at me to leave. I asked her if she knew the man, but she didn't let me speak a single word, just screamed at me that I, I should get out of her flat and never come back again. She cried and basically shoved me outside. I told her to call the police. She almost slammed the door in my face. She did call the police. They apparently found the suspect and questioned him, but he seemed perfectly sane and not at all likely to stalk someone. And they dropped the case again. There was no evidence after all. The man came to the church as always, but after the police had gotten involved, the monotony of his confession was changed. I remember his words clearly. Don't try to lock me away, father, he hissed, and his voice was cold and cruel and oh, so angry. I've been locked away for far too long. The young woman didn't come to church anymore. The monotonous confessions of the man continued every single day like clockwork. The woods, his insomnia, always told me the same words. I tried to catch him a few times to exit the booth at the same time as him, just to see his face at least. He was always gone by the time I exited. After just a few days, I decided to visit the clearing the man always mentioned. The grass was indeed greener around the small cabin, and as I walked up to the building, I had the most intense feeling of deja vu. The, st the stench of decay hung in the air. I was just about to touch the doorknob as intense vertigo hit me. I must have blacked out at this point because the next thing I knew I was sitting in the confession booth with a strange man on the other side. He asked me when I had last slept. I had no answer and he laughed. I dragged my fingernails across my face until I bled. The insomnia took its toll. I, I blacked out for short periods of time. A day later I found myself kneeling in front of the altar, the gilded chalice with red wine in my hands. I couldn't remember how I got there, but I remember that I had intended to pray for the young woman, and I, I did just that. Then rose the chalice to my lips and drank. The wine tasted off. I was hyper aware of the metallic taste that must have belonged to the chalice. I wondered if it was growing rust. My prayers had no use, though. I heard from another church member that the young woman had gone missing. I knew that she was dead. And I knew where she was buried. But I had not a single piece of evidence, and I didn't want to raise suspicion about myself, so I never called the police. God would judge the strange man, I told myself. He could not escape his punishment. The day after I heard about the woman's disappearance, the strange man was already waiting in the booth for me when I arrived. There was no visible clue that he was in there, but I was sure about it. And although I could have just turned around and went back home, what I probably should have done, I resigned myself to my fate, and I entered the booth. He spoke without hesitation. This time these words are burnt into my mind by now. Do you want to confess your sins, father? 
he asked. He sounded smug and somehow satisfied. I stayed silent, not knowing what he expected me to say. I wasn't aware of any sins I'd committed lately. None that would interest him, at least. Instead, I asked him why our roles were suddenly subverted. But he started to laugh, and I tried to claw my face off again. A few days later, I met another woman at church. I had seen her in almost every service. We had never talked before, but she always smiled politely. She stayed behind after the last service and asked if I was alright. Apparently, she was worried because of the deep, bloody scratches on my face. But I couldn't tell her the truth, so I said nothing at all. She was nice. Said I didn't have to tell her. But that she always was there to talk to if I wanted to. I've yet to accept the offer. The situation with the strange man didn't change. He was waiting for me every day when I entered the church, and each time he asked the same question. Do you want to confess your sins, Father? I never answered. He always laughed, and I scratched my face open until one of us got tired of it and left. It's been like that for six weeks now. I don't know what to do anymore. I can't remember the last time I slept. The strange man's laughter echoes through my head at any given moment. My skin is a torn mess to the point where I have trouble to get the blood out of my clothes. One of my favorite sweaters is ruined already. I know I should just not walk into the confession booth. I should stop talking to him, but I can't. I tried. And I always ended up in that booth, tearing my skin open while he laughed. And maybe I should just confess my sins. If only I knew what he wants to hear. I'll stop here. Maybe someone can tell me how to get rid of him. But until then, I have more important matters to take care of. The next service is soon. And we're all out of wine. So I'll need to go and get some more. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's podcast. I want to tell you about one quick thing before we say goodbye for the evening, and that's going to be about the Mr. Creepypasta plush. The plush is only available for a limited time. So if you guys head over to makeship.com, then you guys are able to get this Mr. Creepypasta plush. It's super cool. It glows in the dark, which is really cool. And he's super soft and cuddly. So it's uh, makeship.com slash products slash Mr. Creepypasta hyphen plush. Or you know what's easier? makeship.com. Uh, there you go. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who is supporting me on Patreon. If you guys have been supporting me on Patreon, or if you're considering doing so, then know that I just added in a couple of cool things for the loyalty program because I found out that I could. I had no idea that I could do that. So now, <laughs> you guys should be getting some cool things in the mail brought to you by Patreon that are pretty cool. They support the channel as well. Oh, getting to the point though, a huge thank you to patrons such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, William King, Heather McDonald, Reaper 61167, Alex the Sandwich, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Ness 69420, Isoto Hatred with two exclamation points, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Bardo Hawk 764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Madam Skull Bunny, Sashi Sazaku, Grizzly Olsen Dut Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weeds, Jay, Miss Alexandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kier the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nina Smith, Nico Kayo, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much, so, so much, so, so, so much for being a part of the Patreon and helping me keep the lights on and helping me get exclusive stories and everything that we do on the channel here. Thank you guys so, so much for being a part of it. Thank everybody in the description and thank you guys who have stayed to this part of the video. It really means so much to me. I hope you all have a very happy Halloween and sweet dreams.